Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And to those people we saw earlier for the breathwork practice, thanks for coming back. We actually thought we should just start with a quick breath practice we practiced earlier. So for the people who weren't there, that's all good. I will demonstrate as best I can. We're gonna do the physiological sigh. So simply just start, I'm gonna do it twice. I'll demonstrate it once. It's simply a big inhale through the nose and then squeeze in a little bit more air. And then you can let out a nice sigh or soft breath. <sighs> we'll do it one more time. <sighs> okay, hopefully that helps people settle if you were able to do it. I just wanna take a couple moments to thank everybody for being here to express my gratitude for this all coming together uh, noticing the emotions coming up um it's been a dream of mine to make this happen uh, ever since i got sober over 10 years ago and so here we are today it didn't really come to life in this context until the two lovely people, Dave and Jen came into my life and really helped bring it to where it is today. So I'm incredibly grateful to them and all the other people that have uh, helped over the years, all the teachers in, in the schools that really helped get it going in the school boards. And so here we are today and I just wanted to say thank you for being here and we really hope that you get a lot out of this and that it is a meaningful experience for you. So thank you very much. Great, uh, Mike, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone, good morning, um, especially to those on the, the West Coast, very early morning to you, thank you. Uh, my name is David Zarnett. I am a political scientist at, Univers at the University of Toronto, but also the Director of Research and Strategy at Starts With Me, so the organization that is behind the State of Mind Conference. Um, like many of you, uh, I'm someone concerned about and passionate about emotional well-being and mental health, my, my own well-being, my, the well-being of my new daughter, my dog, my parents, the students. Um, it's something that's always top of mind for me. Um, and I really encountered this issue uh, working at the University of Toronto, where each semester I would encounter more and more students struggling with anxiety, depression, lack of enthusiasm, apathy, procrastination, boredom, deep feelings of uncertainty and dread about the future. Um, so, so that experience over, I guess, maybe the last 10 years on campus really put the issue of mental health on, on the radar for me. And it's a real honor for me to, to, to contribute to, to Starts With Me, to play a role in organizing this conference. Um, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, I think I can speak for, for Mike and Jen, um, but I think our intention, our core intention with this conference is to leave um, or to have us all be maybe a bit more motivated and of course more knowledgeable to address what I think all of us have recognized as a major societal problem in Canada and elsewhere, and that is um, widespread poor mental health in the workplace. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard these statistics before, but let me let me sort of paint a bit of a uh, qualitative or quant excuse me, quantitative picture for you, just to set the stage a bit. Um, one in three Canadians, uh, Canadian employees experience high levels of stress at work. 70% of Canadian workers are worried about psychological safety at work. 500,000 Canadians miss work each week due to poor mental health. 30% of disability claims are mental health related and 70% of disability related costs are mental health related. Um, and each year, the uh, poor mental health in the workplace costs the Canadian economy something close to $50 billion. Um, it's a disturbing picture and I think the COVID-19 or, or I don't think I'm sure the COVID-19 pandemic has made things far more challenging, far worse across many dimensions. So for me, when I think about this issue, the, the big question comes up is, what are we to do? What is, what is to be done about this? How can we as individuals who, who care about emotional well-being, care about mental health, how can we be effective helpers? How can we think about our role um, in addressing this problem in a, in a productive and 
effective way. Um, the conventional wisdom on this issue says all we need to be is more empathic. We need to understand those who are suffering. We need to feel their pain. We need to see the world a bit more clearly through their eyes. Um, we just need more empathy and a lot of this, a lot of these problems might go away. So for example, on April 1st, when the Canadian Mental Health Association issued a press release, they said this year's Mental Health Week, which is this week, ought to be all about empathy. So by intellectual instinct, I'm a contrarian. And whenever someone tells me something, I immediately think, hold on, how might they be wrong? So when I read that press release, and I think, Maestro, you, you flagged it for me, uh, I was wondering, well, is, is that true? Is empathy the solution? Do we just need more understanding? Um, or might there be better alternatives? Is there another way that we could think about being effective mental health helpers and champions? Um, I'm always reminded of this saying, uh, or I think it's from the either 17th or 18th century, uh, good, uh, the road to hell is paid with good intentions. So when I think about helping, I think we ought to think about it critically and be really clear on how we're doing it. Um, so is, is empathy the right way to go about thinking about ourselves as as effective helpers. Um, to unpack these big and complicated questions, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my U of T colleague, uh, Professor Paul Bloom. Uh, Paul, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for, for being our first speaker at this conference. Uh, professor Bloom is a professor of psychology at, at the University of Toronto and a professor emeritus at Yale University. Um, he has a PhD in brain and cognitive sciences from MIT. Uh, he's an award-winning researcher, teacher, and very prominent public intellectual. He's the author of six books. Uh, the most recent one, The Sweet Spot, The Pleasures of Suffering and the Search for Meaning, uh, which I really enjoyed. It makes a strong case for embedding obstacles and difficulties and challenges in your life uh, and uh, argues that that is an essential way to feel better and to have purpose. Uh, Paul, I hope I have accurately characterize your argument, but my apologies if not, but that's what I took out of it. Um, but most importantly, he's the author of the provocative uh, book Against Empathy, uh, The Case for Rational Compassion. And that's gonna be the book uh, that we're gonna, or the topic that we're gonna probe today. So uh, Paul, it's a real honor to have, to share a Zoom screen with you, uh, to have you kick off this conference. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, before Paul, we, we start to tap into your to your brilliance and all of your wisdom. Just a quick note about the structure of this session. Um, Paul and I will have a bit of a discussion. I'll, I'll ask him a number of questions uh, over maybe 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity to have a bit of a Q&A. Uh, at any moment during our conversation, if an issue pops up that you'd like to learn a bit more about, uh, please put it into the chat. Uh, I'm not a great multitasker, um, but I will do my best to integrate uh, your comment uh, into our discussion, uh, and hopefully we, uh, we can all make this a really productive hour for all of us. Okay, so so Paul, thank you again. It's a, it's a real honor. Um, I think I think the first thing I'd ask you, which is the most basic question, is empathy is now this mental health buzzword, but I don't always know what it is. Um, what is empathy? Are there different forms of empathy? Can you sort of unpack this? Yeah. This, this concept for us a bit. Um, first, thanks for the wonderful introduction. It was very kind. Um, I'm delighted to be talking to you. I'm delighted to have been invited to talk to this group and looking forward to actually having a chance to sort of go back and forth and bounce around ideas with people in this room. It could be that writing a book with the title Against Empathy was the biggest mistake of my professional life. Mm -hmm. it, it got me a lot of really weird email and a lot of people thinking like, oh, hey, what kind of monster are you? And a part of the issue is empathy does have different meanings. So some people view empathy as basically a code word for everything good, being a mensch, being good, being kind, love, you know, peace, everything good. I'm not against that. I'm in favor of good things. There's another meaning of empathy, which is more narrow, which is sometimes called cognitive empathy. And that's the ability to get into somebody's head to figure out what's going on with them. And it's very important for a good manager a good therapist, a good friend, a good parent, to know what's going on in other people. And um, that, that sense of empathy is very interesting. I hope we get a chance to discuss it. 
I don't view it as either good or bad. So I think in that sense of empathy, if I really care about you and, and love you and want to make your life better and you come to me, I, it really helps me to know what you're thinking, what's bothering you, what's really going on. It could be different from what you say. That's really a valuable thing. On the other hand, if I want to destroy your life, humiliate you, seduce you, con you, make you miserable, it also helps me to know what, what, what makes you tick, know what buttons to press. And, and some of the worst people in the world are really good at knowing how other people work. The sense of empathy I'm most interested in, and I think it's mo most people focus, mean what they um, use the word, is what psychologists sometimes call emotional empathy, which is to feel what another person is feeling. So if you're in pain, if you're suffering, and I feel your pain, I, it makes, it brings me down, I feel it, I feel, I know what your experience, not only at an intellectual level, but at a gut level, I'm feeling empathy for you. And my book, Against Empathy, was an argument that that kind of empathy might be good for other reasons, might be part of intimacy, might, might have all sorts of goals, is actually a pretty lousy way to, uh, to, to work from a standpoint of helping people and being moral. And I argue that it's biased. I'm much more likely to feel empathy for you, um, you know, a, a, a white male professor at the same institution. You're so much like me than I am towards somebody whose skin is a different color, who's of a different sex or gender, who's in a faraway land. There's, there's a million laboratory studies we could talk about, but also just common sense. It's a lot easier for me to feel your pain than to feel a stranger's pain. And if I rely on empathy, I'm gonna value more uh, you than, than the stranger. There's also the fact that often empathy conflicts with other things we wanna do, like care and, and long-term helping people. And finally, there's, there's empathy is connected to burnout in all sorts of ways. So I don't fully regret calling my book against empathy, but, but I do want, I, I'm glad you let me make it more clear what kind of empathy I'm arguing against. Right. Okay. So, Paul, okay. So you've distinguished between two forms, the emotional empathy, emotional empathy and cognitive empathy. Um, one thing I'm curious about is whether empathy is unique to humans. Uh, where does it come from? Why do we why do we have this ability to empathize, or do other species share it as well? Is it something that's unique to the human experience and the, and the human mind? So those are a cluster of good questions, which we don't entirely know the answers to. Right. We know that other species have some amount of kindness or compassion or caring. Many mammals care for their young. Um, they is many many. You know, primates have what you call friends. They have other other members of the species they hang out with, they support, they groom, they help, and everything like that. Feeling other people's pain is a little bit unknown. How much empathy you get, and you can ask. And part of the question is, um, it, it, there's all sorts of evolutionary reasons why we might evolve to be kind and loving and caring. You know, there's kin selection. We share genes with many people. And we want to help them because that's the way our genes propagate. There's what um, evolutionary biologists call reciprocal altruism or mutuality, where you and I, I care for you, you care for me. As a result, we both do better in life. But where does empathy come from? Why would you want to feel what someone else feels like? Right. And nobody quite knows, but one prominent theory is it has a lot to do with parenting, and particularly um, a mother's bond with her baby. So hormones that are involved in empathy get released during pregnancy and childbirth, for instance. And, um, and it may be an adaptation for that purpose. Interesting. So it's rooted in, in a very, I guess, primal relationship that we have. Um, Arguably, yeah. Right. Um, so so that, that's actually an interesting segue to, to just to build on your, your introductory remarks regarding the, the problems with empathy. Um, if I, so last night, my, my, my six month old daughter decided not to sleep and she was one in the morning and she knew I had a conference today. I don't know how she knew, but she knew it. And Babies are very wise. Yes. And I think they're moral. Some, some very in, impressive uh, person wrote a just baby. So Paul, that's another one of your books. That's a plug if for, for those who don't know it. Um, so she knew I had this conference. Um, and she was crying, and I was just thinking, if I were to empathize with you, little baby, I would be exhausted. 
right? Like, so maybe we can start to get into what are the specific problems with empathy? When we, when I wanted to help my baby cry, she was really struggling. She was stressed out about something. Um, why should I not have empathized yeah. with her? What, what are some of the, some of the issues there? Good. I, I, I think about this a lot at, regarding parents. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a manager, but I, I am a parent. My, my boys are now uh, in their twenties and off to the world, but, but those are exactly the questions. And Here's what you do want to have towards your baby. You want to care about your baby. You'd be an awful parent if you said, oh, who cares? She's crying. Big deal. That's, you, kind of, you want to love your baby. That's one thing. You also want to understand your baby as best you can. You know, your theory seems to be that she was crying to make you tired for the next day. That's a good theory. Um, maybe, she, maybe she was wet. Maybe she had gas. Maybe whatever. And, and, and it could help if she's hungry feeder and all that stuff. Right. Um, but would it help to feel her pain? Well, you know, in your example, maybe it wouldn't hurt, maybe it just hurt you. But there's all sorts of cases where it gets you into trouble. I'll give you an example from a much older case. My, um, my, my younger son, um, I remember this, was very upset one day. And, and, and I asked him, What's, why are you so upset? He said, well, Dad, you know, I have an assignment due tomorrow. And, and I said, that's not big, I got a whole day. What's the big deal? And he says, I was supposed to start working on it six months ago. And he was freaking out. And me, who, this is my big weakness. I freaked out with him. I, are you kidding me? You know, yeah, and, and I would got really upset. And when I come and, and finally, I kind of, you know, shifted a bit. And I said, yeah, well, you know, I love you, Zach. I repeat his name. Fine. Um, I love you, Zach. Uh, I care about you. Let's solve this problem. And, and he was freaking out. I was calm. And in general, in relationships, you want to love the person, you want to understand the person. But if, if I go to my partner and I'm anxious, I don't want her to get anxious. Mm -hmm. If I'm sad, I don't want her to get sad. In some way, it would just multiply my problems. Often what we want to do in a relationship is we want to establish a distance that enables us to help and care about the person. And every therapist knows this. No therapist would have, have a client who burst into tears because they feel so lonely and then start being caught up in waves of loneliness themselves and start crying and saying, I need help too now. Said, no, you want, you want to understand it. You want to care about it. But you also want to sort of help, which requires that sort of emotional distance. And I guess that would be, that, that would be relevant in any, in sort of outside the, the patient client, clinician, con the clinic's context, right? It would be professor, student, HR, um, professional, colleague, yeah. team, in any context of a team. Is that, is that right? Is that? I, I, I think it is. I think it is. Um, and, and this is why, you know, it sounds very pedantic to make all these distinctions. Mm -hmm. The distinctions are vitally important when asking questions like you just asked. You tell people, oh, just feel empathy, and empathy means everything. Well, there's certain things that are good and certain things that are inappropriate or bad. What's good is caring. I'm not going to argue against love and compassion, even at the level of being a manager. You want to, you want to, want to make the world better for people who are, who are under your, you know, under your ambit. Um, and understanding. There's no downside to knowing what's going on in a person. Right. But sharing their feelings is often trouble. It's trouble for you. In that, you know, go back to being a therapist. If you deal, if you, if you have eight meetings of fifty minutes apiece with people who are depressed or anxious, and you feel their depression and anxiety, you will not last a week. Mm -hmm. um, but also, as as a manager, you know, I have, I, I, I'm, I'm not a manager in that sense, but I have students, I have research assistants, and they come to me, and I kind of want to sort of make things better for them. But sometimes that involves not feeling what they're feeling, mm -hmm. you know. They may be furious at somebody else. I don't share their fury. I might say, yeah, I think, you, you know, honestly, you, you shouldn't be so angry. No one, no one meant to insult you. Nobody meant to me. I know how angry you are, but, but I'm not sharing that anger. It's not, it, it, it's not good. Um, sometimes to go back to the example of being a parent, you, if your kid says, um, take a topical example, your kid's terrified of taking a vaccine because it hurts. No good parent says, oh, well, I'm going to protect my kid from pain, so I'm not going to give her a vaccine. Right. 
It's ridiculous. And and you don't sit there and you don't weep and you don't you say, okay, you know, you, you support the kid, you try to make the kid feel better, but you're you're focused on a longer term interest in a way that empathy will not guide you to do. So th that's an interesting so there I guess so, so now there there seems to be two problems that empathy raises. So one is burnout. And um, just to sit on that point for one moment, if there's anyone in the audience who's experienced burnout, um, please feel free to share your experience in the chat. If you if you do want to share your, your thoughts, feel free to turn your, your video or your audio on and, and explain what happened. Um, but it sounds like, Paul, you're saying an over identification with the feelings, maybe over identification is not the right word. And an overfeeling with the feelings of others can yes. actually lead you to not be a not be a good helper because you just don't have the capacity anymore. Um, when my book came out, yeah, I get sure. I got a lot of correspondence, and you know, some people mm -hmm. say they disagree with me, some people agree with me, but the correspondence that um, mattered the most to me are people in the world, in a way, in a way that I'm not, and one example of this is I got it from a woman who uh, was. Uh, uh, an emergency worker of some sort around 9-11 and she she uh, and after you know the planes hit like so many years ago she quit she couldn't do it after but a week she couldn't do it and she said that what my book did eh, she might agree with it or disagree with it, she, it gave her a language to talk about it, which is she mm -hmm. wasn't deficient in love she wasn't deficient in, in concern the problem was her empathy was ramped up too high so she would deal with somebody who was you know devastated about a loss of somebody they love and she felt that devastation and i know i know or know of many doctors or or other people who cannot who, who end up leaving their jobs because they feel the pain of others too acutely right um in addition to burnout there's a second problem you've identified um which is poor long-term decision making um, or accommodating someone who's suffering in a moment, say they don't want the, the vaccine because it's going to hurt their arm. That's right. But in the long run, they're actually undermined. That's so right. you're saying that, so empathy also, it, it not only contributes to burnout, but it also sort of leads us in a direction towards short-term accommodations what actually might not be in the long-term interest of the person we're trying to help. There's an analogy, people who talk about empathy, people who like empathy, like mm -hmm. to use, and I like to use it too, it's like a spotlight, mm -hmm. and it zooms you in, you know, you don't care, and then empathy zooms you in, like, like a, this lights up one particular person at one particular time, and I think it's a good metaphor, but it illustrates two problems of empathy, one is what I mentioned before, it's bias, you know, you focus a spotlight on one person, but not on another. You can't light up the whole room with it. You, you, you choose, and your choices will be based on, on all sorts of things. Maybe you don't want to choose on the basis of if you think about it as a good person. And then the second thing is what you're talking about now, which is empathy zooms you in on the here and now. As a parent, empathy draws you to solve the kids' problems right away. As a friend, as a partner, well, if you care about them, if you want to be good, you, you, you take a longer view. It also sometimes favors the one over the many. So it's a somewhat harsh example, but um, everybody who's been in management at some level or in academics, actually, in a research team, encounters sometimes where somebody has to be let go. They're just not, they're not doing well. They're not thriving. And more than that, everyone around them is suffering because of it. If you have too much empathy, you could never make that kind of hard decision. But because you're not making a hard decision, you say, oh, I'm such a good person. I'm not going to, you know, get rid of this person because it makes them sad. Well, and everyone else is collapsing because you're unable to make a hard decision. Sometimes being a good person involves giving somebody bad news in a way that helps everybody on the whole. And Paul, why is, why does, why does empathy lead us in that direction to want to help a single person at the expense of maybe the collective? Why, why is that? Empathy is an interesting emotion. It's, it's, it's in some way, um, there are some emotions that are kind of diffuse, like mm -hmm. compassion. And I love, I could love everybody in the room. I feel, I wish you all well. And that's compassion. Right. right. Um, fear, um, I, I don't know, uh, anger, you can be angry at a community. But, but empathy is, is in some ways like lust 
or like um, gratitude. It zooms you in on an individual. So, David, I could feel what you're feeling or try to feel what you're feeling. I could really zoom in and try to imagine what it's like to be you. Maybe at the same time, I could do that with Mike. I don't actually think I could do both at the time, but maybe I can. Maybe I have that kind of thing. But I'm looking down on the list and on, on the room, and there's, there's a Jesse and a Catherine and a Derek and an Ella. And I can't do that with all of you. Nobody can. Empathy is, because it involves feeling what another person feels, it is essentially narrow in its focus. Sometimes narrowness is good. I, you know, I, I want to be careful here. Like, I'm with the best friend in, my wor in the world. There's some ways in which focusing on that person directly can be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if I have to make decisions that affect a community of people, the narrowness is, is the enemy of morality. Interesting. Okay. Um, so you help one person at the expense of so many others. Yes. And then sometimes um, also you don't help them at all, but you help them in the short right. term, as she said. Right. Um, okay. So, so on the table, before we move to an alternative, um, on the table, we have empathy is biased. So we're more likely to empathize with those we share certain similarities to, whether that's skin color, gender, sex, whatever, um, political ideology. Yeah. Um, it's bias, or sorry, empathy leads us to uh, towards short-term accommodations over long-term um, solutions. Um, bias can lead us to be emotionally burnt out and maybe lead to psychic yeah. numbing, pushing us yeah. out of a help of, out of a helping profession entirely. Um, would there is there anything else? And maybe there's some I've missed. Um, are there any other big problems with empathy that should be top of mind when we think about whether to center this emotion in our, say, mental health uh, strategizing in a workplace or in our interactions with, with someone who needs assistance? You've done a really good job of capturing the main problems. I guess I'll add one. Yeah. It always struck me there's an arrogance to empathy mm. where I've heard it be said like, um, when I was living in the United States, and, and, and an example that, that uh, an American politician gave says, you know, what we really need to do as, as white Americans is to feel, you know, empathy for what it is to be a black kid who's afraid mm -hmm. of the cops and, and feels this way and that way. And I'm thinking, I don't think I, you know, I, good for you if you say you can do that. I don't know if I could have, feel, know what it's like put myself in the shoes of a kid in that situation. I don't know what I could do, put myself in the shoes of a, of a trans kid facing discrimination of, of a woman who's, who, who is facing sexual harassment. I've never been in any of those situations. I think the idea is, oh yeah, I could do that. I got that one, I got that one, I got that one. I think it's arrogant. Mm -hmm. I think there's laboratory studies, by the way, finding that we are a lot worse at putting ourselves in other people's shoes um, than we think we are. So I think that there are other ways to be a good person. I think we could say, we could, well, we try to be fair to people, try to care about them. But the idea that, that oh, I'm gonna get into your shoes and I'll know what to do is, is even if it were good and had good results, it's arrogant to suppose that we can do something. So that just, just to maybe we'll end in, in this section with, with just maybe one more point. Um, it sounds like Paul, you're making the argument that Empathy also can contribute to inaction. It can, it can make us think that we're doing something just by virtue of understanding when in fact we haven't done much at all and we've convinced ourselves that we're good people but largely in practice we're unhelpful. Is that my understanding of you correctly there? It, it is and, and there are sort of writers who have talked about that, who have talked about the sort of, in some ways self-indulgence of, mm. of empathy. I mean, suppose you're in some sort of trauma. And well, what I could do is really try to get into your skin, try to feel what it's like to be you. And that's in, and they experience vicariously. With, and it's going to bring me, bring me down, but I'll cope, I'll deal with this and so on. Wouldn't it be better for me to say, how can I help this guy? Right. right. I'm not going to bother trying to get, even if it, you know, even if it wasn't biased, you know, I'm not going to try to get in this shit. I'm not going to make his life better. Maybe I'll ask him, what do you need? And right. May, and maybe um, it just seems, it seems that if you are, are racked with anxiety, for me to allow myself, sometimes it's not a choice, but if it was a choice, for me to allow myself to share your anxiety, feel anxious with you, why am I doing this? Who does it benefit? And so, so yeah, there's a self-indulgence to it as well. 
Okay, so so when we're confronted, okay, so the the case you you made a strong case against emotional empathy, and yeah. I, I think that's that's uh, um, I guess like I said, an important distinction to be made between cognitive and emotional empathy. Um, what do we? So it's one thing to tear down; it's another to build up and say, okay, well, here's a productive alternative. Um, the subtitle of your of your book is the case for rational compassion, and I'm wondering if we can probe that yeah. a bit. Um, what is first? Maybe maybe we can just start with the with the second term. What's the difference between being empathic and compassionate? Yeah, it's 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 a, a critical distinction. In fact, and and it's not unique. It's it's been worked on by contemporary scientists, but it's not unique to science. Uh, Buddhism makes it a seem being shallow compassion and that's feeling another person's pain mm. and deep compassion which is what i've been calling compassion there's a whole lot written about it and they say the word burnout's a recent word but they say shallow compassion exhausts you and and mm. and they have the idea the sort of you know exemplar of somebody who in, in buddhist tradition who makes the world better is not someone who's there sobbing while people are in pain and everything it's somebody who's cheerful and positive and um it was actually a nice, a nice collaboration to illustrate this difference um, between Matthew Ricard, who's a, a well-known Buddhist monk, and Tanya Singer, who's a German neuroscientist. And they did all these studies where they make the distinction. They get into people, they scan people's brains when they're in different states. And so um, empathy, if you're empathizing with somebody sad, will make, make you sad, will lead to empathic distress. Compassion is loving somebody valuing wanting their life to be better but it's entirely possible for me to see somebody who's suffering want their life to be better but not suffer myself and you know you could be you know maybe when your daughter's crying you burst into tears as well but and that would be empathy i guess mm. but but you know probably better for you to say, yeah, sing a song try to make her happy try to cheer her up make faces whatever and 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 that's because you love her and that's and that's compassion, and that's the distinction. And so the subtitle captures the claim that there's basically two components to mm -hmm. being a good person. And you know, in some way, I'm not saying anything that that other religious traditions, psychologists haven't said before. One is compassion. If you don't care about other people, you're not going to be a good person. And you know, you can be a smart, you can be an IQ of a million. You know, just, just, that's not going to make you good. You just be you know self-centered and self-interested. Mm -hmm. You got compassion. But then the rational part is figuring out what the right way to bring upon the ends you want to achieve. You want to make your daughter stop crying and be happy. You got to think about it. Right. You, you want to make um, you want to make an employee uh, more productive and more more proud of their job. You're a therapist and you have a patient, a client who's struggling. You got to be smart. You got to do calculate costs and benefits. Do math. Um, you know, the issue in something like a geopolitical issue like the war in Ukraine, I guess in part is to care about people. But okay, fine, you and I care about the people who are suffering as a result of an unjust war. Now, what do we do? Right? Well, that's really hard. Yeah, that's really hard. And, 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 you know, the road to hell, I've been told is paved with good intentions. You know, you could, you could love somebody to death, and then end up doing something which is terribly stupid, right. and doesn't help them at all. So, Paul, if I understand you correctly, com compassion versus empathy suggest compassion is more action oriented. It calls you to do something to help those that you care about. Is that empathy is about emotional empathy is about understanding, but compassion takes us back to, well, what am I actually going to do practically to help someone? Is that is it's compassion more action oriented? Is that am I understanding that right? It could be. I, in some way, maybe I just amend it slightly and say compassion, I think, often leads you to right action more. Mm -hmm. Empathy can lead you to action. It could, it could, sometimes you just wallow in your pain, but sometimes you could, it leads you to immediately want to sort of make somebody better and fix mm -hmm. the problem. I think um, compassion is less biased because it's more diffuse. And compassion doesn't require that you share the feelings of the other person which mobilizes you more towards action. And I think this is in some way the point that you're getting at, which is if you're having a panic attack 
and I really feel what it's like to be you and have my own little panic attack. Oh, you know, we're just panic attacking together. And the world does not become any better. Well, if I say, man, I, I care about this guy. He's in trouble. What can I do? Well, you know, all of a sudden I'm telling you to do this crazy breathing exercise, which, mm. you know, actually did wonders for me this morning. So, so, so it, it makes you act in a good way. Um, okay. So just to, you, you, you did, you did get into it a bit, but the, the, the qualifier of your term rational, uh, of the term compassion, rational, um, what does that mean? Uh, often it's a term, at least in politi amongst political scientists, we yeah. always talk about the rational actor yeah. and it's rarely defined. And I know in probably in the mental health space, maybe it's not a term that's commonly used, but what does it mean to think through a problem rationally? What steps does that involve? How do we ensure that we're being rationally compassionate, and compassionate as opposed to irrationally compassionate? Yeah, it, it's as you know, it's a deep question. The answer could be answered at many levels. Um, some people have mathematical formalisms, what counts as rationality, some people. I, I tend to have a more casual um, use, which is um, to act rationally is to pursue a goal in such a way that um, most likely gets you to that goal. So if, I, if I'm going outside and it's raining and I don't want to get wet, it's rational for me to bring an umbrella. Umbrellas are just great ways to keep the water from getting, getting you wet. Now, if I go outside with an umbre without an umbrella, am I being irrational? It depends. Maybe I like to get wet. And so rationality is always relative to a goal. From this perspective, being cruel isn't necessarily being irrational. Maybe you want to hurt the person, in which case acting in that way to get that way, it could be totally rational. Um, so, so, you know, diving in a little more deep, rationality involves using uh, logic. You know, if, um, if I want Q and I know if I do P, then I get Q, I'll do P, all things being equal. It involves access to the correct facts. You know, um, it's good to, if, if, if I believe that an umbrella full of holes is the best umbrella, well, I'm not going to be very rational. Mm -hmm. and, and this all sounds kind of airy and philosophical and abstract, but it's what every good manager or therapist or friend or parent does. If you know your daughter cries whenever, um, whenever she's wearing you know, the itchy pants, then you change your clothes and all of a sudden she stopped crying. Your goal was to make her happy. You're mm -hmm. smart. You figured out what the best way to do that's rational. Right. Um, so, Paul, when, when we spoke last week, um, you mentioned another really important point that I think is important to flag here in terms of being rational. And, and I think this will resonate with all the HR professionals and business leaders in the room. And that is the importance of uh, sort of the this, this social component of being rational. That, you, yeah. that it's not entirely possible to be rational on your own, presumably because our brains are so prone to yeah. bias. So so is, yeah. Sorry, go for it. I, I think that's right. I, we, we had a good conversation about it. I, I, you know, you, you say, I say, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm this rational man. Let me, uh, let, me, let me go and do my rational thing. Mm -hmm. And people, I think, reasonably enough, distrust me because often the people who shout how rational they are are often the least rational of all. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us, we think we're doing the rational thing, um, but often we are swayed to our uh, self-interest. Mm. There's a lovely little study where you ask people, if, um, if somebody sues you, and uh, sorry, if somebody, if somebody sues you and, uh, and the, the costs, um, and, and, and you have to pay money to protect yourself, to, to, to get a lawyer, and, and it ends up being, they sued you for a stupid reason, should they have to pay for your lawyer? And people say, yeah. That makes sense. That's a rational conclusion. Then you ask a bunch of people the same question only flipped. If you sue somebody and you didn't have any grounds to sue them, should you have to pay for their lawyer? Because they, no, I don't think so. Not very rational. We, there's a million ways in which your biases shape what you think is rational. And so you think we're totally screwed by this, but we aren't because what people can do is put themselves in communities where um, of com people of competing interests, where we could correct ourselves. And that's how philosophy works, it's how science works, it's how good organizations work. You know, um, we are, um, 
my university right now, your, your university as well, are doing uh, PTR reports, evaluations where faculty members get different raises depending on their performance. Mm. So if I'm on the committee, I would say, you know, um, I think the number one thing that should matter, just speaking as a rational person here for, for, for raises is, and I list exactly what I do. And I don't think I'm being self-centered. I just, that's, I'm biased. Like attending a mental health conference, speaking at a mental health conference should get you a raise. Is exactly. I say, isn't this obvious? But someone else says, I, I think teaching large classes mm. should give you a raise. Mm. And I thought, I don't teach a large class. So, uh, yeah, that doesn't sound right to me. And then we bounce. And we all say we're rational. But in the course of it, I have to justify things. And they have to justify things. And this stuff works. Sooner or later, we often come to fair ways of doing things. And so um, you don't want to ask when figuring out what to do in, in, in the Ukraine, you don't want to ask a military contract. You don't want to ask someone who has a vested interest. We want to just get together a lot of people and then talk about it. And I think one of the extraordinary things about people is that we, we've created <clears throat> social structures that can make us more rational a classroom, a discussion, even sitting with your partner, as long as you two are not perfectly aligned in your interests, and you say, you say, um, I think that person was so unfair in what they, they did to me. And your partner may say, well, you know, I'm looking at this objectively, and you, it's not so. You're just being biased because your feelings are hurt. And so rationality is best done by communities. Interesting. So there's a, there, I'm, I'm sort of compiling a list here of all the things we need to do to be rationally compassionate. Um, we need to be logical in the way we think. Um, so think in terms, I guess, cause and effect. Um, we need to compile facts and be sensitive to sort of the factual basis of a situation. Um, we need to be social, but we can't just be social with people we agree with. We need yeah social diversity. We need different perspectives pushing against one another um, in order to get to the sort of the right conclusion, the right decision yeah. to help uh, or to roll out the right strategy or program. Um, anything else that you would add to that, that list? Um, what else should we be thinking about if there is anything else to be, to be rational? I guess on, on top of that, if we can, we should be a bit humble. Right. We, we, we should recognize it's very hard. You know, I don't feel biased when I say that giving a talk at this conference should factor in the race. I feel this is just any normal person would think that. But I, I should also realize that particularly when my rational things, when I figure, oh, there's a friend who's in the hospital, should I visit him? No, I think the right, the moral thing is to give him some space to recognize that maybe I don't want to visit him. And this is why I came to that conclusion. So I think we should be humble, particularly when our moral, ethical, or other choices end up favoring ourselves. You know, I'm on social media a lot, and there's zero humility. And it's always, you know, plainly the facts support me and my team and everyone else is a monster. And, you know, and again, people who do this are not sort of rubbing their hands together saying, haha, I'm very biased. They think they're being fair. This is in some way, there's some research suggesting, and this is old stuff by uh, Lee Ross at Stanford, some research suggesting that if you and I have a grievance together and we're in a disagreement, and I carefully explain to you my side, I get the effect of this is for me to think, get more angry at you and think less of you. Because now that you've been faced with the facts and you still hold your stupid position, how could you do this? And it's because I'm not humble. I think, I think that I'm right. And if I could just sit with you and explain to you, you, you would understand. So, the, so the, the rational individual is open to the idea of being wrong and yes. is open to being persuaded to change their mind. Yes, yes. And, and yes. it almost has a flavor of paradox to it, the way you put it, but I think, I think it's right. The, the person, the, to be rational involves um, accepting that you may be irrational and trying to correct right. for that. Right. Okay. Um, maybe I could throw uh, a few scenarios at you. You know, this, this might put you on the spot, okay. but this is what you're the expert here. So we, I have to. Um, 
a big a big issue in workplace mental health and this is going to this is sort of runs through this conference is a lot of corporations and i think a lot of the hr professionals here can speak to this a lot of organizations provide mental health services to their employees so there's employee meet, employee assistance programs research suggests that for those who use them they tend to be better off yeah now the problem is no one uses them utilization rates are far below what they would be if they reflected need. So what would a rationally compassionate approach look like to promoting help seeking? Because really there, there's clearly obstacles. What, how would we think about, how do we encourage people to seek help in a rationally compassionate way? Um, yeah. So I have an answer. I'm not sure it's a good one. And these things always, people on the ground always know more than mm. the person who's now being asked, had their questions thrown on them. But mm. there's a whole literature on what economists call nudges, which mm. is ways of setting up a situation so that people behave in their best interest. And there's an example in literature, which is very much like yours, which involves retirement savings funds. So there's a lot of companies would offer uh, their employees really good retirement funds. Uh, really good savings plans. You all you got to do is just opt into them. And they're plainly to the people's benefits, but nobody opts into them, very few people. They just can't be bothered to look at them. Right. And the solution that the nudge people argue is make it a default. Just, you don't do anything, you get a really good retirement plan. You don't want it, you could tell them you don't, you, you do, but it's the defaults that matter. So in this case, and I know it's hard, I can't imagine exactly how to put it in practice, but what if every once in a while, these plans, people check on you, they just say, look, you know, all employees are enrolled in this plan. And every six months, we do this, that and other, tell us to go away. But, but you don't have to default as someone looks in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Switching to defaults is a way in which structures can be made so that people behave in their best interests. Okay. Um... Yeah, that's that's actually really. I have a number of thoughts about that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward. Yeah, and I'm just, not sure how it's practically implemented. So that's right, right. Um, okay, so we're about we have about 14 minutes left. Um, so there is time for for some more audience engagement. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to to raise your hand and uh, to your electronic hand, your little blue hand, and I'll I'll call on you if you want to say it. Um, if you want to turn your audio on, your video on, please feel free to feel free to do so. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to pop up, Paul, maybe I can ask you uh, two more questions that I think might be relevant to the audience here. Um, another issue in the workplace is um, just feeling just lacking purpose. Like I just don't care about my work. Um, you know, there's the fan, there's a term presenteeism. So I'm literally at my desk, yeah. but I just don't give a shit to, to, to yeah. put it bluntly. Um, and I think that's widespread. Um, David Graeber has this great book called, yeah. I think it's bullshit jobs. Um, and I think we've all might, I don't know if this is the right word, empath sympathize, empathize with that, with that feeling, understand yeah. that feeling, yeah. whatever, um, whatever word we're going to use, but I, we understand that. Um, What's a rationally compassionate approach to dealing with someone who lacks purpose? Um, and I know you've written about this in your most recent book, so yeah. maybe there's a connection there. Um, how would you deal with talk, sort of engaging with that problem, apathy, really having feeling they have no meaning or purpose in, in what they do? It's a serious problem. Yeah, um, there's different explanations for the so-called great resignation happening mm. now. And, but, um, but one answer is people think, feel people have been sitting through jobs that have no purpose. And after the years of COVID, they said, I'm not going to go back to that. Mm. Um, some, one kind of part of the answer that is not the sort of thing anybody in this room could do anything about, which is the world does contain too many bullshit jobs. Mm -hmm. There are jobs that have no, that, that are kind of unnecessary that are, that are exist for some to fill some sort of hole that people think needs to be filled. But it, if they, if they didn't exist, the world would be unchanged. And if you're in such a job, and I hope nobody here is, then of course you're going to be dissatisfied. And, you know, there's no trickery that can make you think something is what it isn't. 
in fact, if it seemed almost immoral to get somebody to enjoy, to find purpose in their bullshit job. Um, but many of us have jobs that are kind of 50% bullshit. Mm. You know, I, I, I have to look forward to this afternoon filling out travel forms and doing other things. So yeah, it's, you know, um, but a lot of my job I find deeply satisfying. Mm. Um, I think the answer is sort of obvious to say, but difficult to implement a surprising amount of dissatisfaction people have in their jobs. And this is work by Tom Tyler when he was at NYU. Um, isn't how much they're paid. Mm -hmm. And it's not their work, their immediate work environment. It's two things. One thing is whether they feel they're being treated fairly and with respect. If I'm getting paid the last, the least of the company of anybody in, in my, in my organization, but I was the last one hired and it's, and I feel it's a fair procedure. I'm okay with it. It's enraging to to think that other that the payment is biased or 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 some way, you know, unfair. And then there's there's autonomy, and so there's sort of a work culture people fall into, both from themselves and from other people, which says, "I got to make this as easy as possible. I'm going to choose the easy jobs and not the hard jobs." And um, and what people I think who are are wise and autonomous and clever do and organizations that support such people do is they get you in your job and they're going to say we're going to throw something at you is really hard mm -hmm. and it's going to be really hard and really difficult and it seems almost paradoxical like job i would prefer a job that's easier than hard but it's not the case all these studies ask people what they think of their jobs people like difficult jobs right. they like they, they say they have they have meaning and if you think about it it's true to in life. You know, nobody has kids because they think it's going to be easy. And nobody's favorite hobby or sport or game is really easy. Every, the, the enjoyment in life and in, in every aspect of life is to be challenged and to have struggle. And, you know, so, so a good workplace has that as part of it. So often that entails reframing what someone is doing. That's right. In, in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, so Paul, there's two really excellent questions on the chat that I just noticed. Um, one is from uh, our colleague, Jen, uh, who, who starts with me. Um, and I'll, I'll pose both of them at the same time and maybe we can address, you can address okay. them back to back. So one is, uh, it's a really good question. Is rational compassion uh, a skill you can learn? And if so, how do you go about learning it? Um, and the second is uh, from Naya, and, and I, I hope I pronounced your, your name correctly. My apologies if not. Um, what, what's a rational compassion in the context of conflict resolution when there's been harm between two parties? How does that, yeah. how might that work? Um, they're both, they're yeah. both good questions um, and, and, they're, and they're, they're related. Um, I think we can do better at being good people and making decisions. Um, maybe one sort of surprising answer is mindfulness meditation. One of the things it's said to do is quell em uh, this, these empathic responses that get in your way and also nurture compassion. And there's some laboratory evidence, it's always controversial, uh, suggesting that it does just that. And I think we can learn to be more, um, more rational. Um, Julia Gay Galef has a book out called The Scout Mindset, where she lists just different procedures to nurture our rationality. Like, um, one thing, for instance, is when faced with a difficult decision, you might want to ask yourself, if you were starting anew, you didn't have all this history behind you and everything, what would you do? Another way is to ask third parties. There's all sorts of kind of hacks to be more uh, rational and other hacks to be more compassionate. So I, I, I'm an optimist in that way. Conflict resolution is a case where, where we are at our absolute worst. You know, for you to, for you to, you know, when you say, if I say A and you say B, all of a sudden, and B and you say A is wrong, all of a sudden I'm in full defense mode. Mm. And people have written a lot, including Julia Galef on what to do. But, um, but I think one quick and easy hack, or not so easy, nothing's easy here, but one, one is, to, is to bring in other people, to bring in third parties who are somewhat distant from it and can see things through a different eye. And, Great. Um, but but being rational in 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 in, in interpersonal conflict is is one of the toughest. Right. Okay. Um, Paul, thanks for that. Uh, we have two questions. Um, 
Uh, one from Derek. Uh, Derek, if you want to turn your, your, your screen on, your audio on, go, go for it. Your screen is yours. Hey, Derek. Hi, Paul. Thank you for uh, engaging in that discussion today. It's really good to talk about this. I really love the comparison between empathy and rational compassion. Um, I myself am a registered nurse. I'm the occupational health nurse for the city that I work for. And I find in my line of work that a lot of people come to me with their yeah. um, mental health concerns. And I'm just wondering, in terms of when you said that you have to involve your community in decision making, when it comes to individual decision making for each individual employee, how can I engage that community and still maintain that person's confidentiality and their, um, yeah, their, their reliance on me to keep that information private? That's a, that's a great question. Um, it is a practical question. My, my answer, which is going to be sort of vague, and I think you knowing the specifics could do more with is, there are often ways in which you could have a community of people discuss cases in the, in the context of anonymity, mm -hmm. where you say, we're going, to give you, we're going to give you a case. Now, now if you're in a small, uh, a, like a small place where everyone knows each other, that could be practically impossible. You, know, you bring up such a case and everybody, oh, that, that's her. I, everybody knows this, but that's why that's why God created the internet. So, in some way, you could do stuff online where you have communities. Mm -hmm. You could establish a community of people on Facebook or some other or Reddit or probably not Reddit, but on Facebook or something where where you get a team of people. You could even do this very self conscious say, I want to put together a team of people to discuss difficult cases that come up in 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 my job where I could talk about these cases and you don't know the people involved in them. So anonymity is preserved and it could help. I think we do this personally, we do this informally, but having some some formal setup could be, I, I just suggested of some value. Does that make sense for what you're talking about? Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks, Derek. Thanks for that thoughtful question. Um, Mike, let's go to you. All right, I'm jumping in since no one else is. So. I guess can I try to tie two things together. One is historically, therapists are actually bad at knowing the emotions of their clients. So I'm curious on that piece. One is asking people how they're feeling, I think, and also in, into a workplace situation. Asking people how they're feeling is a useful tool rather than just assuming and feeling sort of being overwhelmed by their emotions. And then I had a conversation with a workplace client the other day who said their team is really getting burnt out. And at the same time, a lot of them are have this sense of guilt because they shouldn't think that they should be complaining or burnt out because, and he referenced the Ukraine. So he sort of mentioned this idea of, oh, I don't have the right to feel bad or I'm bad for feeling bad or something like that because of the externalized empathy or something like that. So I'm just, I think a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. And I would love to hear your thoughts about that. How do we allow ourselves to, <laughs> I don't know, acknowledge our feelings without justifying them or comparing ourselves to others yeah. there's such good points I, I i like them um i i agree with both of them i think any therapist anybody will tell you often people cannot tell you what they're feeling um either because they don't know or because they won't they want to be they, they they can't bear to say it however a lot of times simply asking people um is is an excellent way to go forward you just ask people what's going on with you. What are you, what are you feeling like? And this is true for therapy and it's true for life in, in general. I think that rather than try, you know, try to imagine what it's like to be a colleague of mine who, who is apparently a victim of discrimination, um, for me, to, and then sort of I'll put myself in there, she say, how's it going with you? What's, what's happening? What's your complaint? What's, what's going wrong? What's going right? And so on. And language is a way of bridging the gap between other minds like nothing else. And it, it's very powerful. Um, I find the second story you told is shocking in some way because what a terrible thing to say to somebody. It's some version of the parent, you know, yelling at the kid, you know, how could you not eat your broccoli because there's children starving in Africa? Mm -hmm. Well, 
The mind doesn't work that way. If you're, if you're miserable at your job, the, the misery isn't diminished by knowing people have it much worse. Mm -hmm. If that were so, then only a tiny 1% of the world would ever be sad because the rest would be saying, well, I can't be clinically depressed because there's people being tortured to death. It just doesn't work that way. Um, being rejected in love, having a boring job, having, you know, having missing out on a party because of COVID really hurts. And, and if somebody was to tell you that this is a, a life ending tragedy, well, then you could kind of correct them and say, no, people have it worse. But, but if, if somebody to tell you, people really feel pain about these things. You know, I, I feel, you know, um, if a friend, if I, if I, if a valuable friendship of mine collapses, um, it would really hurt. And for you to tell me, well, not as bad as the Holocaust. Well, I, yeah, I agree with you, but, but it still hurts. What do you, and it, it seems like a, like a shockingly insensitive thing that people are saying. And, uh, and so I just advise them to stop. Can I, sorry, Dave, would, I just want to ask Paul about the, is that part of the, I can't remember the word you used. It was so good about the sort of self-centeredness of empathy. Mm. Like, is there that piece there where it's like, they get something out of saying they feel bad for these other people or? I think so. I think that there, I think there are people who, um, who make a huge point of their sharing the suffering of others. And that in itself, I mean, everyone needs a hobby and that in itself does not seem particularly bad. But if this is a substitute for actually doing good in the world or it's yeah. used as a stick to beat other people on the head, it sounds terrible. It sounds, yeah, self-indulgent and kind of awful. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um, Mike, thank you for those. Uh, Paul, thank you. Thank you so much. So we're, we're right up. It, it's noon. Time really flies. Um, I really appreciate all your wisdom. I hope this was, was practical as, as much as possible and useful for the audience members. Um, I, I really learned a lot, especially the important. I love the point about being humble, be, working in teams, seeking out diverse perspectives. Um, and that's the key to making good sort of really helpful, productive decisions for those we love and care about. Um, so for, for that wisdom, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative. So thank you again for this, for this session. And uh, we'd love to welcome you back in, in the future if you were so interested in, in doing so.